Welcome to our observance of the 155th anniversary of the Battle of Buckland Mills. This description of the battle is based on Stephen Fonzo's research entitled, A Documentary and Landscape Analysis of the Buckland Mills Battlefield, which draws on the official records of the Civil War, archeological research for the Buckland Preservation Society, and other primary sources. The Battle of Buckland Mills occurred over 16 hours on October 19, 1863, 155 years ago today. It was three months after Gettysburg. The battle was the final chapter of the 11-day Bristow Campaign, wherein Confederate General Robert E. Lee, seeking to regain the, the initiative in the war, moved out to flank and attack the Union's Army of the Potomac under General George Meade. On October 9, Lee started out from camps around Orange, Virginia in a flanking move north of the Union camps near Culpeper then turn east to Warrington, which is at the bottom left-hand corner of this map, where the bulk of his army arrived on the 13th. Meade countered by moving Union troops along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. On the 13th and 14th units of the two armies bumped into each other and clashed in a short battle in Auburn. With Meade racing to stay ahead of Lee, Confederate General A.P. Hill attacked at Bristow Station at the bottom right-hand corner of this map, he attacked what he mistakenly thought was a smaller Union force. Outnumbered by parts of two Union Corps entrenched behind the railroad right-of-way, 1,500 Confederate attackers fell in the failed 45-minute attack. Continuing eastward, Union forces successfully reached the defensive fortifications at Centerville. Rather than engage such a strong position further, Lee decided to withdraw, starting the march back to camp south of the Rapidan River. Confederate Cavalry Commander Jeb Stewart screened the withdrawal, moving out from Manassas along the Warrenton Turnpike, today's Route 29. On October 18, Union Cavalry Commander Judson Kilpatrick received orders to move out on the Warrenton Pike and ascertain movements and position of the enemy. He soon engaged with Stewart's forces at Groveton at the top right-hand corner of this map and pursued down the pike to Gainesville, where both, both units camped for the night. Ten thousand to twelve thousand men were engaged in the Battle of Buckland Mills, primarily cavalry commanded by Confederate General Jeb Stuart and Union General Judson Kilpatrick. The Union's First Army Corps infantry under General John Newton would also have a role. Under Kilpatrick, General Henry Davies commanded the First Brigade and General George Custer the Second Brigade. In addition to overall Confederate command, Jeb Stewart led Hampton's division as Hampton was recovering from wounds. General Fitzhugh Lee led the other division. Many of the men in Jeb Stewart's brigades were local Northern Virginians, including members of Warrington's famous Black Horse Troop. A relative of General Fitzhugh Lee owned Buckland Farm, on which much of the battle was fought. Their knowledge of the terrain, Local roads and avenues of approach and escape would prove a great advantage. In numbers, the Confederate cavalry outnumbered the Union with addition of Fitzhugh Lee's division, which was operating several miles away near Auburn and would come into play after the battle began. Starting at daybreak on the 19th, Custer's brigade re-engaged with the Confederates, the beginning of the Battle of Buckland Mills. 
pushing west on the turnpike, arriving on the east bank of Broad Run about 10 a.m. Custer found Stewart's forces had occupied Buckland on the other side, placed sharpshooters in the buildings, and set up artillery batteries on the hills above the town to the west. Custer placed guns from Pennington's artillery battery on the bluff in front of the Cerro Gordo Plantation House, home of the Hunton family. This drawing was made by Alfred Wad, who reported the battle for Harper's Weekly magazine. Wad described the scene in his diary in these words, quote, Mr. Hunton's family, consisting of his wife, three daughters, and some servants, took refuge in the cellar. Pennington's battery took position on both sides of the house and the sharpshooters behind its corners and the trees and the fences, all which show scars from the rebel bullets. The Union shells passed over the town and the stream valley 60 feet below, which was fortunate in sparing Buckland and its buildings for future preservation. The shelling continued for about two hours until noon, when Stuart abandoned Buckland and started moving westward on the turnpike toward New Baltimore and Warrington. General Kilpatrick sent a unit of the 7th Michigan over a ford and broad run toward Greenwich, south of the turnpike, and another unit toward Haymarket to cover his north flank. In his official report, Kilpatrick stated, quote, General Custer had succeeded in pushing his command up to the bridge and on the hills to the right of the road overlooking the enemy's position. The 7th Michigan had already crossed Broad Run at the ford and was moving down upon the enemy's flank with a strong line of skirmishers in advance. General Davies' brigade was massed on the left of the road under cover of the woods ready to cross. My whole command being now in readiness to cross, I ordered General Custer to charge the bridge. The charge was successfully made. The buildings upon the opposite side were gained and held by our sharpshooters. And in a few minutes, General Custer's entire brigade had crossed and the enemy was rapidly retiring in the direction of New Baltimore. Where General Kilpatrick saw a successful routing of the enemy out of Buckland, he was in fact entering a trap, unaware that Fitzhugh Lee's division was within striking distance in Auburn. As Stewart states in his official report, quote, After offering some considerable resistance to the advance of the enemy at this point, in accordance with the suggestion of Major General Lee, I retired with Hampton's division slowly before the enemy until within two miles of Warrington, in order that Major General Lee, coming from Auburn, might have an opportunity to attack the enemy in the flank and rear. The plan proved successful. The enemy followed slowly and cautiously after Hampton's division when, on hearing Major General Lee's guns on their flank, I pressed upon them vigorously in front. This map of the core battle area shows the movements from Buckland westward beyond New Baltimore on the turnpike and the Confederate flanking attack from the south. From noon until 3.30, Kilpatrick continued to believe that he was pursuing a retreating enemy. Fortunately for the Union, Custer had delayed to rest and feed his men and horses to recover from the earlier hours of fighting. On this map, north is on the left rather than the top. The double red line is the turnpike, the dashed red line is Vin Hill Road, and the dashed black line is the Prince William Fauquier County line. This area on Fauquier County's eastern border was and still is farming country. The countryside was largely open fields. Custer's 2nd Brigade was spread out over the fields around the site of this building on this ridge where Route 29 intersects Vent Hill Road. Back then, Vent Hill Road was known as the Road from Greenwich. Fitzhugh Lee's advanced troops had captured the 7th Michigan pickets at Greenwich and moved up the road undetected to set up artillery on a higher hill about six tenths of a mile south. 
From there, they could view Custer's position and all the way to Buckland. An open field on this ridge bordered the south side of the turnpike. It was five to 600 yards deep. Just beyond the fence were woods. One of Fitzhugh Lee's units massed in the protective cover of these woods. Many of the troopers were dismounted and in the fight to come would be mistaken by the Union for infantry. Lee's hidden forces waited for the Union troops to pass by on the turnpike. The time was about 3.30 p.m. Davies' 1st Brigade had passed, and Custer's Brigade was just starting to follow. In Custer's words in his official report, quote, I was preparing to follow when information reached me that the enemy were advancing on my left from the direction of Greenwich. Pennington's battery opened upon them, while the 6th Michigan Cavalry under Major Kidd was thrown forward and deployed as skirmishers. One gun of Pennington's battery, supported by the 1st Vermont Cavalry, was placed on my extreme left. This was at the bridge over Broad Run. Continuing his report, the 5th Michigan Cavalry under C Colonel Alger and the 7th under Colonel Mann were engaged in the woods on my right. The enemy advanced upon me, and doing so exposed a line of infantry more than a mile in extent. And at the same time, he opened a heavy fire upon me from his artillery. A desperate effort was made to capture my battery. Pennington continued to fire until the enemy were within 20 yards of his guns. He was then compelled to limber up and retire to the north bank of, of Broad Run. Though told by Custer in these few short sentences, this action started at 3.30 and lasted until about 5. Just as Fitzhugh Lee's line of battle extended a mile, so did Custer's line of battle extend a mile, from the bridge on Broad Run to the woods on his right just to the west of this site. In fighting that lasted about an hour and a half, Custer was forced back over the bridge, which closed the door to escape for Davies' 1st Brigade. The sound of Fitzhugh Lee's guns opening on Custer's position was the arraigned signal for Jeb Stewart to spring the trap. He had reached the outskirts of Warrington at Chestnut Hill, opposite the intersection with Dumfries Road, today's Route 605. Stewart wheeled Hampton's division and attacked Davies' 1st Brigade, driving the unsuspecting Union troopers back down the turnpike through New Baltimore. High hills on both sides of the turnpike are evident in the topological lines on this map. Terrain that worked to the Confederate advantage. In his memoir, William Blackford, Stewart's adjutant, described the Confederate attack. Quote, Hampton's division was formed in two columns, each heading at a gap in the ridge, and all before them was smooth, firm ground. We waited with breathless impatience for the boom of Fitz Lee's cannon. Not seeing us, the enemy was just ascending the little rise behind which we were, not 200 yards distant, when rapid firing of cannon in Lee's direction announced his attack. And at the same moment, our two columns were let loose, and at them we went. Attacked in front and flank, they did not wait for us to get halfway to them before they broke. And then it was a race like a fox chase for five miles. On the Union side, William Glazer of the 2nd New York Cavalry indicates in a memoir that his brigade was driven from their position near New Baltimore, not just by the force of the charge, but by flanking attacks from Confederates who had gained possession of the road to Thoroughfare Gap, today's Route 600. Davies' brigade retreated back to the location on the turnpike where the attack on Custer had started the fight an hour and a half before. Here on this ridge where Vint Hill Road intersects Route 29. He was nearly surrounded, blocked on three sides, rear, front, and right. Here is Davies' account of the retreat. 
Quote, arriving within one mile of Buckland Mills, I learned that the enemy's infantry had driven General Custer's command across Broad Run and held the bridge and fords at the mills. At the same time, a column of infantry coming in on my right from the direction of Auburn threw out skirmishers and attacked my column. Davies had learned that the bridge had been lost from Henry Meyer of the 2nd New York, one of several of Davies' brigade who had gotten through and crossed the bridge with Custer's men. He was sent back to warn Davies. Here is Meyer's account. Quote, I was unable to return across the bridge as the enemy had the other end of it. Riding until beyond their line, I saw some of Custer's men who had been cut off come out of the woods and cross the stream to escape when I took advantage of the confusion to cross to the west side. Being familiar with the country, I made my way around their flank and rear, having the sound of Davies firing to direct me to his whereabouts. I soon reached him and found him pressed, hard pressed. Davies' report continues, quote, I sent forward my wagons, artillery, and the rest of my column to the left with instructions to cross Broad Run and make toward Haymarket, and then with the 1st West Virginia Cavalry and the 2nd New York, attacked and drove back the rebel cavalry that were charging my rear. This done, I ordered the whole command across Broad Run and moved through the fields and woods toward Haymarket. Myers adds, We then galloped across the country, the forces opposing following on our flanks until we crossed Broad Run farther up towards Haymarket. Davies' artillery had meanwhile been conducted away in safety under the guidance of Dr. Capehart of the 1st West Virginia Cavalry, who knew the country well. Forced off the turnpike and running for their lives, Davies' troopers were forced to cross Broad Run over steep banks into a stream at flood due to recent rain. Some died in the attempt. Many more were captured. The battle didn't end with a Union retreat over Broad Run. Stewart continued his report, quote, Crossing at Buckland, General Fitz Lee pushed down the pike toward Gainesville while I, with a few men of Gordon's and Rosser's brigades who could be collected after our unusually long chase, moved around to our left and pressed down toward Haymarket. Here I encountered, besides a large cavalry force, the 1st Army Corps. I attacked their infantry pickets by moonlight and scattered them over the fields, capturing many. General John Newton, commander of the 1st Army Corps of the Union, reported the actions in both Gainesville and Haymarket. Quote, Immediately upon receiving notice from General Kilpatrick of the pressure upon him, and which was reported to me to be cavalry strongly supported by infantry, I sent the 1st Brigade, 1st Division of this Corps, out toward the Warrington Pike, and succeeded in preserving one brigade, I think Custer's, which was being driven in from that road. General Kilpatrick's main body came in on the road from Thoroughfare Gap, that's today's Route 55, in great confusion. My pickets allowed our cavalry to pass through them and attempted to repel that of the enemy, but being unfortunately but necessarily posted in the open ground, they were overborne and driven in. My command was promptly under arms to attack and the 143rd Pennsylvania Regiment was ordered forward to support Elder's battery, which went into position and opened fire upon the enemy about 400 yards in advance of my line of battle. That was about 7.30 p.m. The enemy picketed in front of my line until about midnight when they retired. So, after 16 hours, the battle ended. It was unusual for a cavalry fight, both in length and in fighting several hours into darkness. Amazingly, only 21 were killed, 12 Union and 9 Confederate. The wounded were 51 Union and 29 Confederate. 
For the Union, three-fourths of the deaths and half the wounded were in Custer's 2nd Brigade. The total Union and Confederate killed, wounded, and captured was 304. Fifty of the casualties were infantry and the Union First Corps. Perhaps the magnitude of the Union's defeat is best seen in the 198 men captured, 82% of them Custer's men, versus just three captured for the Confederates. Thanks to Dr. Capehart, Davies lost only one wagon and an ambulance. Custer was not so lucky. His headquarters wagon was among several lost. In it, his personal effects, which included love letters from his fiancée, Libby Bacon. To his embarrassment, several were published in the Richmond papers. Comparing the Union route to a horse race and a fox hunt, the battle became fondly known in the Confederate cavalry as the Buckland Races. Stuart said the defeat was the most complete that any cavalry suffered during this war. Custer called the day the most disastrous this division ever passed through. Of course, 13 years later, a little bighorn would be his worst and final defeat. The Bristol campaign was over, with the two armies pretty much back where they had started 11 days earlier. Robert E. Lee moved his army back to the camps near Orange, Virginia, to prepare for the winter. The Union Army camped for the winter at Brandy Station between Culpeper and the Rappahannock River. This map from 2011 by the Piedmont Environmental Council shows the Buckland Mills battlefield areas in various shades of blue. The core areas of the most intense fighting are in dark blue. From the east side of Buckland at Broad Run to New Baltimore, at Chestnut Hill to the west, and in Haymarket to the north. The approach, retreat, and pursuit avenues are in lighter blues. Significant battlefield protection efforts have been made and continue to be made by the Buckland Preservation Society in partnership with the National Park Service's American Battlefield Protection Program, with Virginia's Department of Historic Resources, DHR, and Prince William and Fauquier Counties. The Buckland Historic District, shown here in blue, is a zone of protection for the 19 acres within its boundaries. In addition, many individual landowners have protected their land with preservation easements which are outlined in green under DHR's Historic Landmarks Program, including the site of this building on the lower left, identified as Stagecoach at Buckland. In conclusion, the American Battlefield Protection Program defines the Buffin Mills battlefield as shown on this map. Preservation efforts focus not only on the core areas of most intense fighting, but also on other significant areas that contribute to understanding and interpreting the events that occurred there. The highway Route 29 is a significant but endangered part of the battlefield on which nearly 50,000 cars drive each day. Ever-increasing pressures to improve traffic flow and safety continually compete with preservation goals. Even so, there are several places along Route 29 from Buckland westward through Fauquier County where the land has so little changed that you can easily imagine the battle that occurred there 155 years ago on October 19, 1863.